At last, the evening ended, and they all went to their homes. Those stuffed tailors' dummies and their mincing, overdressed wives. I was left alone in the silent splendor of the great double horseshoe staircase, lit by the huge candelabra on either side. King, Emperor, God. I was now free to walk through my domain, unhindered by the vulgar crowds. I walked all night, visiting every area of my kingdom, using my skeleton key to open and shut 2,500 doors. But when I crossed the main foyer with its ten crystal chandeliers, I instinctively averted my eyes from the mirrors. These cruel instruments of suffering abound everywhere in the glorious upper reaches of my palace, and a single sideways glance was all it took to give me a sword thrust of pain. But all beauty must have its imperfections, all happiness its share of sorrow. The mirrors reminded me why I was here, why I could never bear to leave this place and build again as Garnier would. The urge to create had been burnt out of me during those fifteen years of ceaseless labor, and in its place there was only the need to possess, to have and to hold. From this day forward, till death us do part. I knew that night that I had relinquished the outer world for good. There remained one little problem to vex my splendid isolation. Ten thousand francs a month I had promised jewels in an insane moment of arrogance. I didn't need to keep that ridiculously extravagant agreement, of course. I had the power to hold that unfortunate little man in fear for the rest of his natural life. But I hated broken promises and dishonored pledges. I hated going back on my word. Disappointment is such an exhausting emotion. All that energy dissipated first in painful hoping, and then in futile, hopeless resentment. It's like waiting for a birthday present that never materializes. Horrible. So, ten thousand francs a month must be found with some alacrity, or within twelve months I would be a pauper once more, and that would really be rather annoying. One grows accustomed to a comfortable income, you see. Money pads the edges of so many of life's little unpleasant situations. It makes one wonderfully independent. And quite apart from jewels, I had some expensive habits to finance. I liked to be tastefully dressed by exclusive tailors. I liked my cloaks and dress suits and shirts to be made exactly to my requirements from the very best materials. I wanted all the beautiful books in the world to line the walls of my library. I wanted the most advanced scientific materials available for my researches. I needed morphine and occasionally a little food. Aisha liked smoked salmon and caviar. Really, I could not possibly think of managing on less than 20,000 francs a month. <laughs> Absurd. That sort of money was not to be had for the asking. Or was it? Suddenly, I had the most wonderfully outrageous idea. 
the idea itself was not exactly new, merely the application of it. Years ago, I had worked alone upon my secret passages. It occurred to me that a mausoleum the size of this badly needed a ghost. Ghosts are the testimony to the past. They give a building character, a sense of mystery and hidden allure. There really ought to be a ghost, I had said to Garnier with mock severity, when we began work on the opera once more, and he just laughed heartily and said that the budget wouldn't run to one, that the minister would have a fit at the suggestion, and how did one order one anyway? But an advertisement in the Revue Theatricale, I suggested innocently. Oh, yes? He inquired with delight, losing for once those harassed furrows which had aged him twenty years since our first meeting. And how do I word it? Wanted, one ghost, experience and good character required. Ability to sing tenor would be considered an advantage. That ought to do it, I said seriously. I'm sure you'll be besieged with offers. Yes, he said, wiping the tears from his eyes. I'm sure I will. A ghost indeed. Eric, I should be out of my mind by now without your droll little comments to keep me sane. A ghost. Yes, that's very good. I must tell that one to Louise. And off he went laughing. And that was all it had been intended at the time. To make the poor, hounded wretch laugh. He had been seriously ill for months during the occupation of the commune, and he didn't look nearly strong enough to face the struggle that lay ahead with the Third Republic, the threats of the ministers, the personal accusations of fraudulent malpractice and mismanagement that would continually be levelled at him as the cost of the opera spiralled ever upwards. Yes. The ghost was no more than a joke at first, intended to amuse a sick man with many worries. It was only later that I began to see certain possibilities for myself. Wanted. One ghost. Experience and good character required. It would be amusing to apply for the post. After all, I did have experience. I had been a ghost before, and a damn good ghost too. I'd driven my mother half out of her mind before I was ten, and then I hadn't even been trying. I'd had vocational training, as it were. Surely, this was a role which lay well within my range. It was just a game to begin with, permitting myself to be glimpsed occasionally as I stalked the upper corridors, appearing and disappearing at will via my carefully concealed trap doors and hidden passageways. A series of Little tricks and illusions added mightily to my awesome reputation amongst the corps de ballet. Silly children, for the most part, who dearly loved to be frightened half to death by a shadow and a disembodied voice. Soon they could talk of nothing in the dressing rooms but the ghost. Those who had actually seen me were privileged beings entitled to respectful silence whenever they began to embroider their tales. <laughs> Dreadful little liars, of course, all of them. But who cared? Certainly not I. There is no legend without artistic license, and no tale 
that will not benefit from the fertile imagination of the storyteller. And what imaginations those girls had, better than mine at times. Sometimes I even took notes for future reference. And so the game was already well established when I began to see how it might gain me rather more than a good laugh. The opera ghost was growing weary of his role as an unpaid amusement. Perhaps it was time he applied to the management for a salary. The more I thought about it, the better I liked the idea. The corps de ballet were already calling me the Phantom of the Opera. An intriguing sobriquet which appealed to me very strongly until I realized it would mean signing my ransom notes P.T.O. Hm. One did not wish to descend to the ridiculous. O.G. I became, and O.G. I have remained. But... I still like to think of myself as the Phantom.